So in the meantime, uh, I will introduce the speaker who needs no introduction. Uh, our next speaker is Ruth Scodell. Ruth is uh, the Emerita Shackleton Bailey Collegiate, Collegiate Professor of uh, Greek and Latin at the University of Michigan. She has published um, extensively on Greek literature, especially on Homer, Hesiod, and Greek tragedy. She has authored an impressive number of articles and several books, including Listening to Homer, published in 2002, an epic face work, um, uh, published in 2008. She has also edited several volumes, including Between Orality and Literacy and Defining Greek Narrative, which she co-edited with Daniel Spearns. Her current projects, which I'm sure are many and varied, include a green and yellow uh, commentary on Hesiod's works and days. Today, Ruth uh, will talk to us about Tithonus the Kitharod. Let's welcome Ruth. What do I need to do here? Right click. I think I'm having. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you can change your display settings. Okay. Sorry. Um, sure. For reasons entirely about my not thinking about it uh, soon enough, I had to send the PowerPoint around because I don't have the proper connector for my computer. Um, I don't own one and the department was closed, you know, and they're in, the connectors are in a locked cabinet. <laughs> okay. So we all, all of us who are old enough probably remember when the Tithonus or old age poem was the new Sappho instead of the old new Sappho. Um, uh, in 2004, I think. It, the poem uh, begins with an address to Pides of uh, unspecified gender who are urged to be enthusiastic about the beautiful gifts of the muses and the song-loving liar. They have to take it over from the speaker, who is now too old and no longer beautiful and so no longer suitable to participate in a chorus. And also, uh, she can't dance anymore because her knees have given out. The translation on the right is one that I actually uh, threw together to read aloud at a gathering at a, at a dance camp um, full of people who constantly complain about their knees, but they have ibuprofen and braces and, at the end, surgery. <laughs> Sappho did not have these things, so she could not dance anymore. The poem may or may not actually end, and this is a problem I am going to touch on but can't really talk about very well, um, with this version of the myth of Tophonus, who they say was snatched away uh, by dawn and carried to the ends of the earth when he was young and beautiful, but uh, gray old age grabbed him in the end despite the immortality of his wife. Now, in 2015, I foolishly agreed to write a chapter on myth and Sappho for the Cambridge Companion, for which they were specifically looking for people who were not standard Sappho types, which I am not. And that's actually important here, you know. I'm kind of a Homer and tragedy person. Um, but I happened to go to uh, the Toledo Muse Museum of Art to see uh, an exhibit on the Berlin painter and his world, and I discovered that there is a whole series of red figure illustrations of Dawn's uh, snatching of Tithonus, and he's holding a wire. And I had not seen anybody really talk about this phenomenon. Um, this is the name base of the Tithonus paper. It's one in which the fact that he's crowned is quite visible. 
Um, and the crown matters because that tells you that he was probably actually performing, whether in a symposium or you know, in some kind of festive context. He just, he's not practicing with the thing. He's performing. Um, it's also significant that throughout this series, he's not happy, you know? This is not a willing abduction. Um, the liar sometimes even turns into a sort of weapon. Um, and in this one case, uh, Eos has actually grabbed it from him already. Um, and I think, you know, and here it looks to me as though he's hoping to bat her away with it. Um, okay. So what does it mean that we have all these pictures of Dawn and Tithonus with a liar. On the one hand, we can assume on the basis of our general familiarity with Greek poetry that his music makes him sexier. Um, this is part of his attraction. He's young, beautiful, uh, and he can sing in play. On the other hand, I find it really interesting um, that she's messing with the performance, you know, and in one case, she's taking the liar away. Um, so there seems to be a certain tension, um, as if on the one hand, music makes you attractive, and on the other hand, you can't play the liar and actually engage in sexual activity at the same time. Um, now, there's no proof that any of these images are actually relevant to Sappho. They are later, they are attic. Nonetheless, I think it's worth considering the possibility that Tithonus was already imagined as a kithirode for Sappho. Um, and if so, there are interpretive uh, implications that uh, I am going to sort of throw out, but effectively avoid. Um, so, on the one hand, uh, liar playing with presumably singing as a feature of Tithonus could add some support to the argument of Richard Yanko that behind uh, Sappho's version lies uh, her familiarity with the story uh, clearly attested first in Hellenicus that uh, when Tithonus became old, she turned him into a cicada. And the cicada is the being that sings forever uh, and is normally thought to be sort of happy to be singing forever. Um, this is pretty clearly an older story than its attestation because in the version of the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite, our first version of this story, even though there's no mention of his being a cicada and the end is presented as a disaster, his voice flows endlessly from the room where she puts him. Um, why an endless voice? probably because endless song lies behind um, the, this narrative. Um, the question to which I think Tithonus as Kithrode might be relevant, but which I have nothing useful to say about, is the question of where the poem ends. Uh, the Oxyrhynchus papyrus uh, continues for four lines with a fragment that is confirmed as Sappho by its quotation in Athenaeus. Um, I put up here Campbell's translation. Uh, what you do in trying to interpret this as a possible end of the poem if you're thinking about Tithonus, I do not know. The 
or Pazdoi might go back to uh, the cicada version by suggesting some kind of hope uh, from the speaker that a divinity might bestow uh, some better conclusion. Um, it seems to be a positive view of the speaker's career in the final two lines. My one positive suggestion here is that speaking of uh, Tithonus at the end, if Tithonus is thought of as a singer as well as a young and beautiful person, brings back the message to the addressees of the beginning. Um, that it suggests that Tithonus is not or is not only a gender inverted exemplum relevant to the speaker, but is somehow profoundly relevant to the addressees, um, whom most interpreters seem to forget by the time they get to this point in the poem. And there we are. Um, the only uh, person I've seen who mentions the vase paintings is Burl in this article, and he gives it one sentence. So I thought it would be worth coming in here and just saying, look at these and think about it. I don't know what it means, but it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. of an animal into, it is a transformation story. And if we are thinking about Tithonos being transformed into Cicada, a Cicada, or at least, you know, an, an eternal voice being transformed into something mortal, something mortal than a mid song, then that, I don't know, it seems interesting. I don't know if it works, but. Well, yeah, it's interesting. The problem is that if Sappho really wanted us to think about Tithonus' transformation, why didn't she say something about it? Well, if, there's the Medea's supplement for one more. If he wants to see a petty There's that. Yeah. So the, the argument is we are missing a more. But um, I have no strength of this. I was wondering because I was really interested in the adversarial aspect portrayed in the in the vase paintings. I wonder is there any way that you could see that mapping onto this somewhat adversarial relationship that Sappho is constructing here between the old age taking her skin and making her hair go white, and that in turn makes distinguishes her from from the young ones. Is, do you think there's anything to that that theme ties in? Uh, you know, sort of violent approach of old age? Well, maybe. I mean, I've also wondered if there isn't a hint that the best thing is to be young and in the chorus, hmm. and you are going to have to get married. But, you know, marriage poems often have that not quite, I don't know if adversarial is quite the word, but, you know, really you'd rather not. Uh, and I wondered if that's at some level there. Sex may be inevitable, but that doesn't mean uh, the young girl is not at her happiest time of life when she's surrounded by other girls, 
Although I also need to think through what it means if we imagine this um, as addressed to males, which is philologically completely possible. Pides can be anybody. Yeah, all right. Well, that's interesting. I mean, the vases are various shapes. Um, they don't look intentionally funereal. Um, but frankly, I don't know enough to have an opinion about that. It did strike me that um, there is no single form for them. Um, the theme appears, you know, uh, you can't really see. Some of them are Lakothoi, some are Kylicus. Um, at least one is an Oinokoe. Um, but, you know, if they are made for funereal contexts, that's interesting too. Tithonus seems a very peculiar choice for that. Um, but an interesting one. Yes, Diane. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the loudness next door. So um, I really like thinking about Tithonus as singer. To me, that puts the ending even better as part of the poem because then you've got uh, Tithonus as ever growing old, but also ever singing, forever yeah. singing. Um, so yes, what can one do? One ages. However, the compensation is to be able to continue to sing. She can't dance, but she can still sing. And so you've got also the connection with all the forms of Kalos beginning and end right throughout it that connects that very ending. So you've got uh, Tithonus, once beautiful, right? So, you know, then you have singer old, singer right. old, but the compensation is to be able to continue to sing. Yeah, although the interesting thing is, as I suggested at the beginning, um, she can only sing the way the cicada sings, that is, um, informally, because old ladies do not participate in choruses. Well, she can't be dancing, but what's the objection to picking up the lyre and singing? Because if she's actually singing with a chorus, everybody in that show is supposed to be good looking. I think that's a Greek attitude. So she can probably still sing you know, when it's not a public performance, but she can't sing in public anymore, I don't think. Hmm. Interesting. It struck me that um, there are choruses in some places explicitly of old men. I don't think there are ever any of old women. Greeks just do not like, I mean, it's like Hollywood. <laughs> you know. I have one other que one question, and that's uh, on there you're using Wes? Um, yes, I'm using Wes text. Why? Mostly because it was easy for me to get. Okay. And because I am not, uh, I'm pretty agnostic about the condition of the text. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Why would not be the singing for the song? The song, when it was played, is related to Aurelius. That is the poet. Well, if I understand what you're saying, uh, it is the poem itself that is the consolation. 
it doesn't really matter whether she performs it. Um, and that seems to me perfectly true. That is, um, she composes for circulation and re-performance. Um, yeah. Yeah. That adjective is often associated with the description of singing yes. with the cicada. So that might be the hint to where she's going with the poem right there. If you know how we just talked about the human voice, Rigorossi's that, that right. quality that they love. But Lee Gooks. It's a lighter quality. Um, it's, it's a voice quality. I think it's both, actually. But it is often a voice quality. And in fact, the fragment of Hellenicus is preserved by the mythographist Homericus when he's talking about the old men on the walls of Troy whose voices are compared to cicadas. Um, and yeah, that's the language. Understand the performance of this, uh, or the original, uh, the, the intended premiere of this uh, song, <coughs> and I, I always thought that Altman is a bit parallel to you back in the day, like an old man, right? And uh, the Dr. McNair, uh, the, the maidens are performing their dance, but um, you don't see this as a parallel. Well, I worry about it, OK? I find it hard. Um, it is, I guess, possible that she does, in fact, in effect, lead the chorus of dancers, and that she makes a point of her unsuitability precisely as an apology for being someone who should not be out there in public. Um, because it is odd. You know? um, on the other hand, I think it perfectly possible that this is, in effect, uh, a non-public poem. It's intended for small group performance, and the addressees are a virtual chorus and not a real one. She's imagining uh, a group of young people some of whom might be present, but they're not actually, at this moment, dancing. Mm -hmm. I do think recent scholarship has tried to make Sappho in particular and Greek lyric in general as public as possible. And I think we've overdone it. Um, I think it's possible to mention choral performance in a song that is not, in fact, a choral performance. Uh, yes, sure, Alex. Thank you. Uh, do you. It seems, when I read this poem, the important contrast, to get back to something that was asked before, it, with um, the, Im the immortal wife is not, is not death with immortality, but old age with immortality. Um, Geras and the Athanaton Akwete. So does that, um, and yet the, normally what we think of in the, the Tithonus as cicada story is not only that he grows old, becomes a cicada, but that in fact he becomes immortal um, and sort of this bad immortality. It's one version, or maybe he's happy singing forever as a cicada. Um, but does thinking about him as a singer affect the whether we think that um, immortality and immortality in song maybe is an important element of this, or is it just the contrast between um, death and uh, sort of immortality in old age? Right. So if you're immortal, then you don't have to get old. 
Well, I think that's exactly the question. That is, in the hymn to Aphrodite, any transformation that's good is pretty clearly suppressed because Aphrodite is using this as a negative example. She doesn't want to do that to Anchises, therefore she's dumping him after a one-night stand. It's not a very good argument. Um, <laughs> in fact, it's a terrible argument. You know, Aos made this stupid mistake, and because she made what I know is a stupid mistake, I'm just going to never see you again and um, require you never to mention that we had this encounter. Um, but that is, the outcome for Tithonus can be good or bad. Um, and if you stress the continuing power of song, it is at least not entirely bad. Um, what I don't know about this poem is whether she wants you to think of the not entirely bad outcome or not. Um, I just cannot make up my mind about it. But certainly, you know, on the surface of the text, it doesn't sound good. Um, even someone whose singing was so great that along with his good looks, it got a goddess to uh, take him up. You know, he still just got old. Now, one thing I have suggested elsewhere, though, <coughs> is that his immortality is not in this poem at all. She carried him off to the ends of the earth when he was young, and he got old. And I think it's actually possible that Sappho knows a version in which um, he's not immortal. She just gets tired of him, and he comes back to the real world, as it were, and he dies. Like Pelops, you know? When he had to, he went to Olympus, but then um, they sent him home in Pinder's version. Yeah? Just to go back to the, the idea of a semi-public or a private performance, does, does that not reinforce this link between performance getting old, still singing, but only to chaos, the beautiful goddess, uh, she God, and, uh, and the poems that I can write about? Well, again, I don't know, because while in the hymn to Aphrodite, the only person who's going to hear this voice is Aos. Um, I have tended to assume that in the metamorphosis myth, Tithonus is um, the paradigmatic cicada. And cicadas sing to everybody. They're insanely loud. <laughs> and they're everywhere. So, you know, I don't actually assume that Tithonus is uh, a private singer. He's certainly not a formal singer. Um, but cicadas are ubiquitous. <laughs> <laughs> and much less appealing than that. <laughs> Any more comments or questions? <coughs> So let's uh, thank her one more time.